Hi, it's Dr. Isom. I'm back to give you the next part of the Chapter 3 Personality Assessments Lecture. The first part of this lecture, I spent introducing the idea of personality assessment and describing a couple of ways in which personality tests can vary. I also mentioned two types of personality tests, the objective and the projective kind of personality test. And this lecture, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about projective personality tests. So what are projective tests? Every projective test has this common element, and that is that it presents some sort of an ambiguous stimulus. Now this could be a picture, maybe an abstract drawing or an abstract artistic picture, or this could be maybe a scene of two people or a group of people in some sort of a setting that could be interpreted multiple ways. It could be that the experimenter might be asking you to draw a picture. They might just say, draw a picture of a person. What those all have in common is that there is no clear-cut answer. There is no particular interpretation that is correct or more right or more wrong. And so it's believed that when the subject is responding, their response contains parts of their personality, their thoughts, their emotions, their experiences, their beliefs. All of those things get projected onto the stimulus through their answer. These kinds of tests require the subject or the client to describe what they see or tell a story or draw a picture that the experimenter asks them to draw. This idea that a person's personality gets projected or comes out in their response to this ambiguous stimulus is called the projective hypothesis. The projective hypothesis is basically whenever a person is given an ambiguous stimulus to describe or to draw or to tell a story about, for example, their response is gonna be influenced by their non-conscious beliefs, needs, feelings, experiences, basically their personality is gonna come out in their answer. So it was originally thought to be a way to get at what a person's personality is really like and get past the problems that you have with response biases, like social desirability, for example. Answers to any projective item are always thought to reveal inner psychological states, and these include the person's personality, their needs, which Henry Murray called their implicit motives, and their motivations. Here are some examples of some projective tests. We have the Rorschach ink blots, the TAT, which is the thematic apperception test. This is also known as the picture story exercise. That's a shortened version of Henry Murray's TAT. Other tests that I'm going to talk about include the draw person, the kinetic family drawing, and I'll also mention the house tree person. After the subject has responded to these ambiguous stimuli, the next step is for the clinician, who has to be an expert in analyzing these kinds of tests, does an analysis of the content of the person's responses. So they do kind of a qualitative analysis, looking for themes, looking for specific ways of responding, because those are indicative of different personality characteristics and also things like depression, anxiety. At least this is what the clinicians who use these tests believe. And in the United States, over 80% of clinicians do use these tests. And that's kind of a problem because if we look at the reliability and validity data on these projective tests, they are not great. The truth is you can get more reliable and more valid data about a person's personality from objective tests. But nonetheless, a lot of clinicians insist on using these. And there are some other reasons other than getting a valid assessment of someone's personality that you might want to use a projective test in clinical practice. And I'll talk about those too. The first one I want to go into detail on is Henry Murray's thematic apperception test, which is also known as the picture story exercise. It's a shorter version. Henry Murray thought that our personalities are really made up not of traits like Allport hypothesized, but by these needs or these implicit motives. That's what he called them, implicit motives. And he thought if you show a person an ambiguous stimulus and ask them to tell a story, then that person's personality will come out into their responses. Their personality in the form of their needs will be apparent in the stories that they create. Now, I mentioned that the validity and reliability for projective tests, are it's not great at all. 
But of all of the projective tests, the thematic apperception test is probably the best, but still it doesn't even come close to more objective measures of personality. The MMPI, for example, which is an objective test, is much faster to take and administer, and the results are much more valid and reliable. So how does this test get administered? There's a series of cards, and what the researcher does or the clinician does is they show the person each of the cards one by one. They're fairly large cards. They're 11 inches by 15 inches or so. And on just about every card, there's a pencil drawing of at least two people engaged in some kind of a social interaction. But the exact social interaction is not very clear. It's very ambiguous and open to interpretation. And you can literally think of hundreds of different stories to explain who they are and what they're doing. Now, when you give somebody the thematic apperception test, Henry Murray developed a specific protocol that you're supposed to follow when you administer this test. The instructions are for the person to tell a story about what's going on in the picture, to make sure that story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, to tell who the characters are in the story, and then what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and then how it turns out. In other words, how the story ends. Afterwards, the clinician or the researcher evaluates each of the stories that were produced for each of the cards, looking for evidence of implicit motives or needs in each of the stories because Henry Murray thought that needs were the driving force behind personality. So whereas Allport thought that traits were the important building blocks or the things that make up our personality, Henry Murray thought, no, no, it's not traits. He thought they were needs. And although Henry Murray didn't come up with a specific scoring technique to assess all those needs, up to 40 needs have been identified as scorable in the TAT. Here is a listing of some of them. So, for example, if the couple that's featured on this TAT card is described as a married couple having an argument when the husband grabs the woman's arm to keep her from running away, the needs that might be identified are need for affiliation because of the marriage, perhaps need for dominance because the husband appears that he's trying to control the wife's behavior. And if the wife is described as trying to get away so she doesn't get hurt, possibly the need for harm avoidance. Those are just some examples of needs that might be identified by a clinician during the TAT analysis. The next projective test, and probably the most well-known projective personality test, is the Rorschach inkblot cards. Now this is an actual inkblot card. I didn't used to show them, but they are literally all over the internet, so I thought I could get away with showing one. Rorschach actually developed these cards not to measure personality at all, but as a way of diagnosing schizophrenia. He thought that showing people these cards that are highly ambiguous would elicit distorted thinking in their responses to the cards that's characteristic of schizophrenia. In these days, the Rorschach is used in clinical assessments and it's used by really most clinical psychologists as another way of assessing not only mental health but personality as well. And as I mentioned, the evidence for validity of these cards is not great and neither is evidence for reliability but they are still consistently used. Just a little more information about Rorschach. He developed these cards specifically to be ambiguous so that they would elicit lots of different responses from people. And he literally created them by spilling ink onto a paper and then folding them in half perfectly so that they create these symmetrical inkblot designs. When you are administering this to your subject or your client, you show them the card and then you ask them, what might this be? Next, and have your pencil ready, you write down everything that the subject says that they see in the cards. These could be movement, this could be human or animal figures, this could be animate or inanimate objects, this could be something that they see in the whole inkblot, or things that they see in parts of the inkblot. Several systems for scoring the Rorschach have been created that incorporate these kinds of details, but none of them show the kind of validity and reliability that you would get from an objective personality test. Clinicians also do behavioral observations of how the clients respond to the inkblot cards. Are they very interested? Does it stress them out? Does it create anxiety? And so on. Even so, assessing personality with the Rorschach is just really not that valid. 
Here's another example of a Rorschach inkblot card, and this one comes later in the series. This one increases the level of complexity, it adds different colors, and all of these things were thought by Rorschach to elicit lots of different responses since they're so ambiguous. And that ambiguity in the responses is what allows people who use the Rorschach as a personality test to base their assessment on the projective hypothesis which is the idea that if you present an ambiguous stimulus to a person, then their personality, all of their beliefs, their thoughts, their emotions, their experiences, all of those get projected onto the answer. And in the case of the Rorschach, they'll get projected onto the items that they see, the way that they respond to the cards, and so on. Here's another example of a projective test, and this one's simply called the draw person. When you administer this test, all you do is you give the client a piece of paper and you ask them to draw a person. That's all that you say, although you do advise them not to draw a stick figure. And then once you get that drawing back, the clinician will analyze it for lots of different variables, such as do they have all of the body parts that you would expect for a person? Do they accurately draw fingers, toes? Does the person have hair? The clinician then uses the drawing and the variables that are scored in the drawing as an assessment of that person's personality. Those that argue that it's an assessment of personality make claims like drawing eyes that are really too big for the face are signs of paranoia or anxiety, or forgetting to draw a face is a sign of depression. But there is very little evidence to suggest that there is any validity to that claim. This test is more often used as a test of visuospatial ability or to determine whether there is brain dysfunction. Here's an example of a draw person drawing. As I mentioned before, not only can you use this as a projective personality test, this is also a developmental test where you can score that person's visuospatial ability. And in this case, that was the specific use for this test. They were trying to get an assessment of the client's mental age. And this was drawn by a child. You notice that they're missing fingers and they're missing feet. There are aspects of the body that are not there. And that resulted in their score to be consistent with a mental age of six and a quarter years. Although some psychologists swear by the draw person as a test of personality, it's probably more appropriately used as a test of brain dysfunction and visuospatial ability. The house tree person test is another example of a projective test. This one is claimed to not only assess personality and their developmental age by the person that's drawn, it's believed to give you a little bit more information about how that person perceives themselves in the world. Similar to the house tree person test is the kinetic family drawing. And this one can be really illustrative as well. For example, my youngest son was giving this assessment at the Kremen Preschool on campus, and his kinetic family drawing had me, the mom, and the dad all standing in a row with his older brother and his older sister. Then, all of a sudden, you see this child up in the air who's drawn bigger than everybody else, and that was him. <laughs> So it, it not only gives you an idea of their visual spatial development, but also possibly how they view themselves in comparison to the rest of their family. Now, one of the things you need to do is you need to make sure that you ask the child or whoever does the drawing who the people are. And for example, they would ask why he drew himself up in the sky above the rest of the family. Because one of the things you don't want to do is make assumptions about the drawing without first verifying them with the person who drew them. Although the kinetic family drawing as a projective personality test probably isn't that valid, it does provide an opportunity to assess the personality of the person who created the drawing by asking about the different items in the drawing and their motivations behind drawing them. One of the things that projective tests can do, and this is particularly true with the kinetic family drawing, is that they are a way for clinicians to kind of break the ice with a new client, particularly with kids. It can be scary for a child to come into a psychologist's office and have to go through an assessment. And sometimes it's tough to get them to start to talk. Having them draw a picture and then asking them about the people in the picture can sometimes be a really nice way of breaking that ice. Another thing that projective tests can do that objective tests can't is sometimes they provide a way to get information, and this is for very skilled clinicians, they provide a way for the clients, and this is particularly true for children, 
to provide information that they may not be able to give otherwise. So for example, if they are shown one of the TAT cards and the story that they tell contains, for example, sexual information that at their age they really shouldn't have knowledge of, then that's one of the ways of understanding the experiences that that child has gone through. Sometimes kids won't have the language to talk about the experiences that they've gone through. One of the times that this can be important is when, for example, you're doing assessment of child abuse or child sexual abuse. You can get information from a projective test, from a child telling a story or drawing a picture, that there's really no other way to get. So that is one of the definite advantages of projective tests over objective tests. So looking at projective tests overall, there are a lot of advantages to projective tests. It's not all bad. And one of the most important ones is that they can be a good way to make the client comfortable or break the ice. They can also be a way to get information from the client, from a child in particular, that there may be no other way to get that information. And there are no other objective assessments that can give you the kind of information that a child can when they're telling you a story. It might be the only way that some clients will be able to provide information, in fact. So what are the drawbacks? Well, as you can imagine, when you're giving a projective personality test, like the TAT, for example, and there are a series of cards that you show to the client and then ask them to tell you a story, that can take hours. It's usually not shorter than 30 to 45 minutes, and that can go on for quite some time, depending on how detailed the person's story is and depending on how willing they are to talk to you about it. And when you're paying someone to administer the test, that can take quite a bit of time, as well as paying them to analyze the responses, which can be even more time consuming, you're talking about a really expensive way to assess somebody's personality. More importantly though, it's really questionable whether the personality information that you get from these projective tests is really valid. And research has shown that you can get the same information about a person's personality from an objective personality test with much higher reliability and validity than with a projective test and you can get that information quite a bit faster. So the bottom line is that although projective tests do have some definite advantages, overall they are not very reliable and not very valid. The most valid is probably the TAT and other less expensive objective tests can give you that information faster and in a much more valid and reliable way. So just to recap, Projective tests are used by many clinical psychologists, the majority of clinical psychologists in the United States to assess personality, even though they haven't been shown to be that valid or that reliable. But of all of them, the one that's shown the most validity is the TAT and then the Rorschach. One other comment has to do with whether or not they provide behavioral data. One of the reasons why Funder argues that they provide behavioral data is because not only are you interested in their responses, which are the stories that they tell or the items that they see in the cards or the drawings that they create, they also provide a way to observe the person's behavioral data. So in that way, Funder argues that they provide a source of behavioral data or B data. So that's it for projective tests and I will talk about objective personality tests next.